good morning and welcome to this webinar. My name is Jennifer Henry and I serve as the Executive Director of Kairos. Kairos strives to bring together peoples, indigenous, settler and newcomer in shared commitments to ecological justice and human rights. We work with networks of activists in Canada, uh, with global partners around the world and with Canadian churches. And we are so grateful that you are present with us this morning. I want to begin this morning uh, and this webinar in a good way by acknowledging the land in which uh, where I am located and where the Kairos uh, Toronto office is. This is the land of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and more recently the Mississaugas. It is land governed by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to care and share the land and abundance around the Great Lakes. And the wisdom and responsibility of this covenant to take only what you need to share and leave some for others, to keep the dish clean and to come in peace. That wisdom and responsibility continues to resonate in this day and this time. For Kairos, it is a spiritual practice to begin with a land acknowledgement. But as we turn today to the topic of this day and this webinar, I want to recognize the particular poignancy of this practice. We do so in an action of truth telling, as a gesture of gratitude and a commitment to continue to work towards right relations with Indigenous peoples. And I would encourage you to take a moment, wherever you are right now, to acknowledge in your heart and in a moment of silence the First Peoples and the treaties of the land in which you inhabit and to express gratitude. So we'll just take a moment. So this morning, this, this webinar is a labor of the heart of both WIAM, the Palestinian Conflict Transformation Center, which is a 10 year partner of Kairos, and of a delegation of Canadian church leaders who visited WIAM and other partners in both Palestine and Israel in November of last year. And our focus today, as it was in the delegation, is on the human rights implications of the ongoing occupation, but particularly on women's experience, women's empowerment, and the role of women in peace building. Our delegation prioritized hearing from both Palestinian and Israeli partners, and particularly the voices of women, whether in Bethlehem, Jerusalem, or Tel Aviv, Gaza, or communities throughout the West Bank. And for more information on the delegation, we're happy to share the report that I think Rachel has provided the link within the chat. So today we're going to keep to that theme of women peacemaking in the context of occupation as the overall frame. But we're also going to try to intersect with the issues and the day, the moment, the conjunctural moment, particularly the impact of COVID-19 and of uh, annexation. And our plan today, in terms of a flow, is to hear from our partners, our colleagues uh, at WIAM, and then to have brief interventions from the delegation members before turning to opportunities for Canadian advocacy and some questions and answers. So yes, this webinar is information sharing in context from those on the ground today in Palestine working with communities and from those of us who were honored to be present a few months ago in both Israel and Palestine as listeners. And this webinar is a call to solidarity action. But I want to suggest that it's also a practice of hope. And we spoke about this a little bit as we were preparing. When we gather, as we do this morning, to hear from the heart of struggle, when we pay attention, when we honor each other with our time, when we equip ourselves for persistent action, when we are present even in such a disparate gathering as this, we are practicing hope. 
And my experience of hope, which is so vital for the continued struggle for justice and equity, the continued struggle for just peace in Palestine and Israel, is that it can be borrowed for a while. When we can't find it ourselves, when despair begins to consume us as it sometimes does, the mere presence of another committed to similar struggles can help us rediscover it in ourselves again. So today I open this webinar in the desire that it is learning and action, but most of all, a spiritual expression of hope that even with the pain and struggle so lasting, so acute, that things can be different, that just peace can be realized, that this is what we believe. So I'm going to turn now to our first speakers from WIAM, the Palestinian Conflict Transformation Center. WIAM offers community-based programs for children and youth and women including income generation, legal training, and workshops on human rights. And WIAM works with a women's shelter. It runs weekly women's groups at the center, as well as several groups that uh, meet in several of the marginalized vi villages in the West Bank. And we were able to uh, have an opportunity to interchange with some of those women and groups while we were there. So we're, <laughs> I, I, the word is honored. Uh, and it is a deep uh, and lasting honor for us to be partners with WIAM as Kairos. And I will invite uh, the WIAM staff to uh, speak to you at this time. I think the way it will happen will uh, begin with the, um, the center's beloved director, Zugbi Zugbi, uh, followed by Tarek uh, Zugbi, who is uh, bring his insight and the indomitable Lucy uh, Talji, who will also speak, the Women's Program Coordinator. And so I will turn it over to our friends at WM uh, to hear from them on the context and the particular issues facing uh, Palestine in this moment. Thank you very much. You are humbling us. Actually, I would like to say thank you a lot for your compassion, for your empathy, and sincere partnership. This is giving us hope and always renewable hope. Mahatma Gandhi says, truth never damages a cause that is just. And so our call and our talk will be about justice. And as we am involved in this issue, we are talking about restorative justice that redresses the wrongs rather than avenging them. So we are happy to be in this Zoom and to continue our uh, discussion and to help to raise awareness here and there, as well as to go in the less troubled road for justice. You know, we am as a grassroots organization and it is based on community-based society and family is the viable socioeconomic unit. And at WIAM, as a result of COVID-19, as a result of the threat of annexation, we haven't sit silent and idle at home. We work diligently with the people, whether in the office or outside the office. Our at our homes, from our homes. Our homes become our offices when there is lockdown. So what we do is we do a lot of psychosocial support for communities, for individuals by phone, as well as face-to-face. -face. We mediate a lot of conflict, you know, with this kind of prison, more conflict increased. So we try to solve conflict amicably between people. And third, try to provide some support of food, help, hygiene to the affected, afflicted uh, families and people. And we we'll continue to do that with a spirit of openness, with a spirit 
that we are here to serve the people, no matter who are the people, without discrimination about gender, sex, religion, uh, family, uh, political affiliation, religious affiliation. And we'll continue to do that, despite that this big prison becomes a small prison. And the threat of annexation is at the door. And, you know, people talk about annexation as if it is a new thing. No, it is not a new thing. Since 1967, the state of Israel has, you know, continued to do annexation from annexing East Jerusalem in 1980 and consider the eternal unified capital of Israel going to the wall, uh, you know, which uh, took almost 19% of the West Bank up to this today. We are not talking about annexation as the problem. We are happy to end the occupation. When there is no occupation, there is no more annexation. And we can live together, uh, people in the Middle East, side by side, with our rights guaranteed and rendered. Now, you know, with the COVID, you know, cases are increasing. So far in the Palestinian area, we have more than 5,105 cases with 25 people dead and 171 Palestinian died in diaspora. Shows that the importance to have a home. That doesn't mean if we have a home that the death toll will be less, but at least we are much more comfortable. Nowadays with the COVID, we feel that we are separated from the whole world too. And uh, with the annexation threat, another, you know, a nightmare for us. Before I go on, but let me remind you with the people in a small prison. Since March 5, there are more than 900 new prisoners since March 5 this year. And uh, since 1967, 69 people died in prison as a result of medical neglect. So what we are looking for, emancipation. We want to be free from the small prison and the big prison. Before I continue, I would like to pass the microphone to Tariq, who will talk about the annexation. Yes. So I just want to echo some of the words that were said and thank you all for being with us and a special thank you to Kairos Canada, which has been supporting justice and which has been in partnership with us for the past 10 years. And it's always uplifting and rejuvenates our hope when we see all of you viewers, we see this organization, many others that are taking time from their day not worrying about their own pandemics or the conflicts within their communities or societies, and instead coming here to engage with our narrative, with our experience, and listen to us. And hopefully, we'll be moved towards helping us fight injustice and bring about justice. So if you look on the presentation that we have, we have three maps. They're all the same map, and they're all of Trump's proposed peace plan. The reason we don't have a map of the annexation is because nothing has been clearly defined yet. At the moment, everything we know about annexation from the Israeli government is through oftentimes very vague statements and with little information about different territories that will be affected. But as he was saying, annexation isn't something new. It's something that has been practiced since the creation of Israel and since especially in 1967 with the creation of the settlement movement. If we look at the three maps, you can see, especially in the first and the last, of course, the one in the middle is the current, and then it moves to either of those if this annexation, based on Trump's plan, is to go through. What we see is a Swiss cheese Palestine. Palestine already looks like a Swiss cheese, but this will deepen the divide between the different territories. And especially for the delegation that was here, they can tell you some of the checkpoints and some of the difficulties, the physical barriers that the average Palestinian has to go through 
to move from one territory to the other. With annexation, this divide in these physical barriers will increase. And one thing that has been clear from the get-go is we've had Israeli spokesperson after the other from the government, official spokespersons, saying that the Palestinians in those annexed territories will not be given citizenship. They will not be given the same rights as Israelis under Israeli law, but they will be living under Israeli law and in some cases under Israeli military law, just like many areas of the West Bank already do. So annexation, how will it impact our life? It will impact our life socially, economically, and politically. When we talk socially, of course, creating this divide between the different communities. Since 1967, we have been alienated, especially after the establishment of the Palestinian Authority from the Gaza Strip. And so already you have the West Bank and Gaza Strip divided, and they're so divided that they've basically become their own subcultures. And now that will increase on the level of the West Bank within the West Bank between these different societies. Also with tensions rising, because of annexation, a large part of the West Bank's food basket or bread basket will be taken because in this annexation, it's oftentimes the land that is most fertile with the least number of population that is annexed first. And so within that, within our context, the olive tree and olive groves and agricultural farmland is a socioeconomic viable source of income for many families and households. And so with the loss of that, we expect the loss of unemployment, the loss of income for many families. And already one third of all Palestinian households suffer from food insecurity with another third being at risk of food insecurity. And since COVID began, we were on lockdown in March, and up until June 21st, we had less than 600 cases. But what we've also had is the loss of the tourism sector and the tourism industry as tourists haven't been able to come into the Palestinian territories. And so we've seen unemployment rise drastically in Bethlehem reaching over 80%, upwards of 90%. And so we expect this food insecurity to be on a drastic rise and continue to do so without any adequate plans or without any adequate sources to help alleviate the suffering or the scarcity that has been caused and created by both the annexation and the COVID crisis. Furthermore, the annexation moves to increase the number of settlers and settlements and to change the settlements from settlements to Israeli annexed territories and land. And within that, we already see cuts in the water supply. Bethlehem has received a 70% cut in its water supply. And we are also will be seeing cuts in the electricity supply. Due to the political situation, unfortunately, and the lack of control on the borders, Palestinians must go through Israeli channels to be able to bring in the equipment. And for security reasons, which until the moment do not have to be disclosed, Palestinians haven't been able to produce or build their own electrical facilities. And 90% of the trans water border or of the water resources on transporter have been restricted and confiscated by Israel. And so we rely on Israel and the Israeli government for both our water and electricity supply. And with this threat of annexation, with the increase of settlements, there's already been plans underway to cut the supply drastically to the West Bank to be able to feed and supply the new and growing settlements with this electricity and water. And maybe before continuing, uh, we'll transfer to Lucy, who will speak more about annexation and women. Uh, I will be talking about the, the impact on the women. Uh, for the Palestinian women who are already facing dual oppression of the Israeli military occupation and the Palestinian patriarchal society, COVID-19 and the consequence of the lockdown have become a third threat of the violence. Uh, we am is uh, currently focusing our efforts on mitigation the increase in the gender-based violence during the pandemic through an emergency response plan. 
This includes providing a free line 24 hours, a GPV helping line service, as well as counseling, securing protection for survivor in the shelter, carrying out media intervention and awareness campaign. Uh, and locally and globally and continue to document human rights and international uh, human rights uh, violation against women throughout Palestine. The pandemic is not showing us new problems. It's worsening known issue. That's what the women, UN Women Special Representative uh, said. We know that crisis can worsen the economic, social, and political situation of women and girls, deepening existing inequalities. But this can also be an, op an opportunity to move forward and not to go backward. To emerge from crisis, this crisis with re resilience, and to build back better than equality must take center stage in all aspects, recovery efforts from ensuring the stimulates plans address the needs of both men and women equally to encouraging and promoting the role of uh, men at home and in the child care as equal partner in the household. But as we are saying this, a new threat has continuously been gaining ground and that threat is annexation. Uh, Tariq was he was speaking about the annexations, but the annexation plan definitely will negatively affect the livelihood, environment, education, health of women in the areas under threat, especially in the Jordan Valley. The major effects on women and other people in general represented in preventing women and other people uh, from benefiting their land and live in dignity. Girls and women will likely be more isolated and less financially empowered. Moreover, all the communities will likely experience limitation on their rights, a freedom of movement and access to land, services and livelihoods. Unemployment is skyrocketing. Crisis and severely crucial economic activity. The annexation will thus impact women with an added sharp in increase in domestic violence, which is a very serious issue that we are facing. At the environmental side, the annexation of fertile ground in Jordan Valley in particular, which represented the food basket of the Palestinian, would change the fertile land into settlements, render a functioning Palestinian state impossible by depriving of the land and the natural resources necessary to sustain itself. We are addressing you as we are extremely concerned about the ongoing poli uh, policies taken by the Israeli government against the land and, and the people of the Palestine. That is leading towards a further process of annexation. Annexation means the perpetuation of the systematic denial of national and the human rights of the Palestinian people. Threatening the rule-based world order and a uh, prospect of a just and lasting peace in the Middle East. Canada, Canada as a beacon of freedom as moral responsibility to strongly oppose the annexation because it would likely extinguish any chances of the peace in the future. To leave the Palestinian in impossible, difficult situation and likely explode tension locally and in the region. Thank you. Uh, I will, uh, yes, please, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Lucy, thank you, Tarek. Let me remind me with something, that when we talk about the occupation, we are not against Jews. We are against the occupation. We are against the system. The system is evil. The people are human beings. And many times we look at this conflict as a conflict of the dysfunctional family of Abraham. There are challenges facing us during the COVID-19 and the annexation threat. First, the absence of international of groups is very, uh, you know, terrible for us. We need to have international presence nowadays more than ever. Second, since the world is busy with the pandemic, many of these countries who have the power 
are very busy with their own affairs. So Israel can do different things on the ground. Third, the economic situation is deteriorating more and more. We talked about women, women who used to be uh, representing 18% in the workforce, now it is less. Unemployment is skyrocketing. For example, in Bethlehem, 90% or more are unemployed. In the whole West Bank, more than 50%. In Gaza, is higher. And so, to give you an example, the GDP per capita in Palestine is $3,198. In Israel, 41615 And we buy the same food for the same price. Four, uh, such challenges. The absence of the Arab voices in, in the area and the absence of, uh, you know, uh, modern peace-loving presence here and there. And as you know, the, uh, except for Jordan and some Arabs inside Israel are very active. And this also with you give us a renewable source of hope. Uh, the uh, weak position of some governments in the West at this moment. And the UN is really has no teeth. This is also very strong, uh, you know, challenge. Uh, some of the Arab countries are making normalization without any progress in the peace process. So this creates a lot of things. What we are left in scenarios, you know, Israel tried to enact, but they could don't talk about it as an accession. They talk about imposing the Israeli law on contested uh, territories. It is not contested, it is occupied, and the annexation is uh, a violation of human rights. And when Israel tried to dismantle the PA and uh, drain the resources of the PA, what is left is chaos, uh, maybe uprising, Israel might perpetuate the status quo, the status quo to have more land and less Palestinian people, and, and or at the end it is, uh, you know, taking the land and no people at all. And we will talk later on about hopes. I appreciate so so much uh, your comments uh, that you pointed out so clearly the that this particular crisis of annexation is within the long context, a long history of the experience, the practice of annexation. You pointed out for us the 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 impacts that it will present uh, on livelihoods, on mobility, on a sense of connectedness, on basic needs, uh, and particularly, Lucy, the the focus, and I think we want to keep this focus very clearly on the multiple oppressions of women, uh, uh, experienced by Palestinian women, and particularly uh, the threat of, of uh, domestic violence and the possibility of that increasing in this kind of context. And And I appreciate very much the very clear call to us uh, as Canadians to not turn away, to uh, keep our focus, to despite the challenges uh, that the community is experiencing around the world in terms of the pandemic, to not um, leave you without uh, uh, our vision and our voice in terms of moral responsibility and call at this time. So thank you very much. I, I intend we will come back together uh, to you at the end uh, with some questions at the end, uh, but we will turn now, if it's okay, to the, to the delegates. Is that uh, okay at this time? Thank you. So um, we were really privileged to, uh, to, to go and to see. And I will um, invite each of the delegates to give a brief uh, reflection from that experience. Uh, we'll, we'll go through a few of those interventions. We'll have a brief break uh, and then we'll continue on uh, and then circle back to the partners uh, after some advocacy calls. But we will begin now um, 
with Lori Ransom and so pleased to have Lori uh, with us this morning. Uh, Lori was a delegate of the United Church of Canada. She works there focused on Indigenous uh, ministries and justice and I'll invite uh, Lori to speak to us now. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, and greetings to everyone who is uh, with us this morning. It uh, was indeed a privilege to be a member of this delegation. I learned so very much. This morning, I'd like to invite all of you who are listening to think about the children of Palestine, to think about what it's like to grow up under occupation, that on a daily basis, one is, is in, in an environment where one on a, going, to church, going to school, going to churches, yes, or mosques, walks by walls and military checkpoints and armed, armed soldiers with guns. And what the psychological impact of that is, is on the children and the generations growing up. One of the most disturbing um, meetings we had, emotionally disturbing and, and challenging meetings with a group called Defense of Children International in uh, Ramallah. And it was echoed by information we received from Beth Salem, a human rights organization in Israel. And this concerned the detention of Palestinian children, children of the age of, of 12 to 18, who are not tried in civilian courts, but are tried in military courts. Some 500 to 700 are convicted a year, and there's a 99% conviction rate. 70% 70, 70 of these children are convicted for the act of, of throwing stones, often at a soldier who they're frustrated about. Many are taken 50 to 60% from their homes in the middle of the night, blindfolded, handcuffed, sleep deprived and transported in military vehicles. They're interrogated without family members present and often without a lawyer present, although that is their right. Sentences can be from three to 12 months in prison and UNICEF regards this military tension as something that remains widespread, systematic and pervasive. There are 25 documented cases last year of children put into solitary confinement for on average of 16 days. My personal background has been dealing with survivors of residential schools. For five years, I worked for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, which was the first commission in the world to focus on the childhood experiences, the childhood trauma of children. So I'm acutely aware of the intergenerational impacts on children and on their families of, of experiences of trauma. It's a story very familiar to, to people in Israel as well. And so that's something that, that moves us deeply and deserves, uh, deserves attention. One of the things we recommended to the Canadian government as a, as a delegation was to urge the government to closely monitor and report on the treatment of Palestinian children arrested by Israeli forces and prosecuted in the military court system. And I hope uh, this morning you will, you will think about what it's like and, and consider, consider how we might support them. That's all for me. Thank you, Jennifer. Lori, thank you. And um, it's, I think it's particularly poignant that you draw the connections uh, to our own history of human rights violations and our own oppression of, of children. Uh, and it reminds us that we, when we speak about these kinds of questions, we speak with humility and, and we need to make, make the connections. Um, I'm going to invite now uh, Lana Robinson to speak. Lana was a delegate from the Canadian Friends Service Committee of the Religious Society of Friends and uh, I, inv I invite her to speak to you now. Um, Lana hails from uh, British Columbia and uh, like the other British Columbia delegates, uh, folks on the panel, uh, folks who are joining us, uh, it's early for all of you and also early for Lana, so thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, and everyone joining us this morning. Um, I'm going to take a personal approach uh, here um, because I was dramatically changed by the experience. I went on the trip with my own notions about how things were. Uh, my knowledge of the history and issues in the region was limited, uh, but I felt like my understanding of it was fairly easy and simplistic. There was Palestine and Israel, the oppressed and the oppressor, victims and villains. These people were worthy of my compassion. 
and these people were not. In my mind, it seemed that easy, uh, and to tell them apart was an easy thing. But so much of what we heard and what we saw was so much more than I could have uh, expected. The stories uh, from the Palestinians were more heartbreaking. The history is so much more complex. Uh, the, the tension more palpable and the occupation itself uh, more brutal than I could have imagined. Um, my simplistic view of things uh, crumbled uh, with each visit that we made to uh, the women's uh, groups, the refugee camps, the hospital, the water projects, and the offices of diplomats, Palestinian peace workers, and of the various church leaders. But uh, it fell apart completely when we visited with the Israeli uh, peace activists and human rights defenders. This is where my most profound learning and opening took place. We visited with the Coalition, for women, uh, Coalition of Women for Peace, which brings together Israeli and Palestinian women uh, to work together for non, uh, in nonviolent activism. We visited Bethlehem, uh, an Israeli human rights organization and information center that works specifically to end the occupation. And Zokrat, uh, which is also an Israeli organization that seeks to ensure that the history of the Palestinian exodus in 1948, the Nakba, uh, and the subsequent and ongoing erasure of Palestinian communities is documented and shared, in particular with Israelis. We met with Amos Gwirtz, who founded Israelis and Palestinians for Peace, and we had a wonderful conversation with Rabbi Jeremy Milgram, who works with Rabbis for Human Rights. All of these people uh, work within their, their Israeli communities. They're working for peace and the recognition of human rights for Palestinians. They work to end the occupation. The security measures that we uh, saw that were needed to protect these people in their own country was astonishing. Uh, it rivaled certainly what we saw at the Canadian Embassy when we were there. And all of these workers told us stories personally of being shunned by family and friends, being blacklisted for employment opportunities, and being harassed, victimized, and criminalized as citizens in their own communities, in their own country. These were Israelis defending the rights of Palestinians, working to educate other Israelis and communities at large to change minds and open hearts. Uh, these Israelis are building relationships and community where there was brokenness and fear. Their losses in doing so were evident and devastating. It's one thing for uh, the oppressed communities and marginalized communities to struggle for justice for themselves. And certainly it is they who must be at the forefront of those struggles and lead the way for the rest of us uh, to come along. It's another thing to be an ally, to stand often in opposition to your own family, to your own community and your own government to fight for justice and the human rights of others. There must be a call to support and protect those who stand up for human rights. We see that many of them who risk their lives and livelihoods are often made targets themselves. The Canadian government has made a commitment to protect those who are human rights defenders uh, here and abroad. And this commitment requires action urgently right now in Palestine and Israel. Personally, I have come to see that my idea of victims and villains has no place in the seeking of justice or peace. So the idea that some are spared the pain and suffering of the occupation by virtue of their identity as Israeli has been replaced with the understanding that none escape the suffering that the occupation levels. Certainly, Palestinians suffer and have suffered unimaginably. It is also true that Israelis suffer in different ways and for different reasons. But I am convinced that none escape the prison that is the occupation. Continued annexation will only spread the suffering and it must end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lana, and particularly for reminding us of 
the alliances that we must build uh, across difference with the common goal of ending the occupation and, and bringing about just peace. Thank you for your words and your presence. I'm going to turn to the Reverend Rosalind Kant Latan Elm, who represented the Anglican Church, um, including the self determining Anglican Church of Canada. And I, I want to recognize and uh, express our gratitude to Reverend Elm, who was one of the co chairs of our delegation and so led us and helped uh, facilitate our presence in the many conversations that we had uh, with communities. So thank you, uh, Rosalind. Sigoli, uh, Sigoleg, thank you for um, the introduction. Uh, it's a privilege and honor. Uh, to be uh, here uh, with uh, my colleagues uh, and all of you this morning. Now, I have to, I have to be honest that um, I am still recovering from this experience. It's difficult to go um, <clears throat> back to the Western context uh, here in Canada and to the context of the continuing colonization of Indigenous America. But what I've come to realize in the six months of reflection, and of course, with uh, thinking about the Palestinian reality of the already annexed territories um, there in, in, in Palestine, is that their participation um, in liberal democ democracy requires an understanding of systems and structures of privilege and the dignity of personhood. Uh, from my own experience here in Canada, I know that to participate, which is a basic right, by the way, is to understand uh, that personhood must be recognized. This is not a political question, at least not a political question when speaking from a liberal demo democratic reality in which we sit in now, it's about humanity, it's about rights, and it's about dignities. The Palestinian people, as we travel through the rolling hills of that beautiful and ancient country, what we found though is infrastructural weaknesses, water, sanitation, healthcare, the Palestinian people struggle against normalizing these weaknesses. They have bodily control daily of where they go and where they don't go, who can come with them to medical appointments. This is systematic and administrative occupation. These walls, checkpoints, food insecurity, being kept from digging wells, farming and grazing to a replacement of incarceration and terror. Personhood, peace and security is difficult under these conditions without the organizational capacities of Liam, without their partners. These organizations come together to teach, to educate, to create spaces in which Palestinian communities, Palestinian communities of, that are marginalized, women, children, but also communities that work with Palestinian communities, Israeli communities, coming together to create this space of peace and justice. Women, youth, and men come together to assert their right of personhood. It's not even about participating in the political structure of the Israeli state, but to just to demonstrate their own dignity, their own right to speak, their own right to, to farm, their right to create economies, their right to live. And they do this under this auspice of occupation occupation that threatens their humanity. Palestinians 
Israelis deserve the opportunity to live together. And this is what these organizations, these partnerships create, those opportunities. This is the great hope. This is the great hope that is being demonstrated for the world. So I encourage you to advocate with a good mind, peace and justice, justice to the personhood of the people of Palestine. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Rosalind, and keeping focused on the dignity of every person and the struggle to preserve that dignity in a context where uh, there are there is this kind of push to normalize human rights violations and impoverishment. Um, thank you for your words. We're going to turn to one more voice uh, before uh, we take a, a brief health break for a sip of water or uh, another coffee. Um, and that is uh, going to come to us via video. The other uh, delegation co-chair uh, was the, the National Bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Canada, the Reverend Susan Johnson. And uh, while she's not able to be with us in person in this uh, webinar today, she did send a, a brief video uh, greeting and uh, message. So we, we'll hear that now, and then we'll go to a brief uh, five-minute health break and return uh, to hear the remaining voices, to focus on advocacy, and uh, return to the partners with some questions. So to um, Susan, uh, Reverend to Susan Johnson now, the National Bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. Hello, I'm Bishop Susan Johnson from the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. Last November, I was one of four of our delegation who had the opportunity to go to Gaza. Although I've been in the West Bank about 20 times, it was my first time being in Gaza and I was horrified by what I saw and what I learned. This year, the population in Gaza, a very small um, geographical area, will top um, 2 million. 40% of the population is unemployed. 62% of the population is 15 to 29 years old. So you know what that does on youth to have that high incidence of unemployment. 80% of the population at least is on partial, um, at least partial dependence on international aid. So that gives you a sign of the poverty in the region. There's problems with all kinds of infrastructure. The electricity is controlled by Israel and is turned on and off. They only get a few hours a day. Fuel to run generators is expensive and diesel fumes um, contribute to the, the air pollution in the region. Uh, the sewer systems are inoperable. Raw sewage is being um, dumped into the Mediterranean. There is a freshwater, or there was a freshwater aquifer under Gaza, but it has been overpumped in competition between the Gazans and the Israelis and is now 96% salinated and undrinkable. People buy water. Um, but the water is not always safe that they buy. And in the end, it's poor people who can afford the least who end up drinking unsafe water. This polluted water, the salinated water, has led to a lot of waterborne diseases and a very high incidence in, uh, ki of kidney failure in the population due, of course, to the salination in the water. The schools are also overcrowded. They are running three shifts a day, but of course that means a very short school day for every child, not enough education. We saw great work being done by churches and NGOs, but there is not enough work to take care of misery in that place. I think one of the moments that made the greatest impression on me is when we were visiting a, social, a psychosocial program with 11-year-old girls. We saw them going through singing and dancing and playing, and they looked like happy little campers. And then we realized that they have already in their lives gone through three incursions into Gaza. And that still, every time a rocket goes off, every time a bomb drops, those girls are re-traumatized, as is much of the population. Those young people will grow into adults moving forward, and I can't imagine the lifelong trauma that they're going to experience. My deepest concern is uh, about the future for Gazans, 
but also the future for those in the West Bank. Annexation will have the effect of continuing to take away land and making the land mass for Palestinians in the West Bank smaller and smaller, like it's happened in Gaza. It also means that the very best of locations, of resources, of arable land, of old um, producing all of um, um, uh, fields uh, are being taken away, all the resources. And it's going to mean increasing poverty into Palestine, increasing taking away of, of infrastructure and resources like electricity and water, which already affect the West Bank. And I worry that the West Bank in the end is going to be more and more like Gaza. It's time for us to intervene and advocate. We need to ask the Israelis not to go ahead with annexation. We need to speak out to our government and to our elected members of parliament to take a stand and speak out for Palestinian people at this time. Thanks very much for your participation in, in this webinar. Thanks very much for helping us work to keep peace with justice between Israel and Palestine. God bless you. Turn now to um, the Reverend Andreas uh, Thiel, the rector of St. Matthew's Anglican Church in Windsor. And Reverend Andreas represented the uh, Primates World Relief and Development Fund, a member of Kairos on the delegation. So I'll invite him to speak to us now. Thank you, Jennifer, and thanks to our Zoom masters, who I think are being kept quite busy uh, keeping our, our webinar going. Uh, it's good to be with you today. Uh, my role on the Kairos delegation to Palestine was to represent the Primates World Relief and Development Fund, also known as PWRDF. Uh, for those of you who don't know, PWRDF is the Anglican Church of Canada's Agency for uh, Sustainable Development and Relief and we have enjoyed a long-standing relationship with Kairos Canada. Uh, for me, one of the highlights of the trip came when a small uh, group of us traveled to the Gaza Strip. If you were listening before the break, you would have heard uh, Bishop Susan Johnson tell a little bit about that trip. Uh, while we were there, we met with the staff of the Al-Ali Hospital in Gaza City and we learned directly from them about the special uh, urology equipment that the hospital purchased through PWRDF support. This uh, urology equipment is being used to address a serious problem uh, that affects many people in Gaza, but particularly is devastating to the children of Gaza. And that problem is kidney stones. Uh, as some of you heard before the break, the drinking water of Gaza is so uh, terribly contaminated, largely because of seawater intrusion from the Mediterranean, but also because of over pumping and pollution. And so that means that the only safe source of drinking water is bottled water. And for a large portion of the population that lives on something like five or six dollars per day, bottled water is simply not an option. And consequently, far too many people have no choice but to drink the, the only water uh, that is available to them. And of course, that is uh, water that is damaging to their health. So after seeing the urology equipment, it was reassuring to know that this small hospital in Gaza City now has some equipment to treat kidney stones and to help some of the most vulnerable citizens of that place. On the slide, you'll see a picture. Um, if you look at it closely, um, you'll, you'll notice that uh, we're looking at some shelves in the hospital pharmacy. You'll also notice that uh, nobody in the picture is smiling and that's because we're uh, listening to some very grim statistics. The pharmacist in the, in the lab coat is telling us that at any given time, about half of the medical supplies in the hospital pharmacy are at a zero balance. We are looking at shelves that are uh, more empty than they are full. We were told that the hospital draws up an annual budget 
but it just takes one brief episode of violence with Israeli forces to render that budget completely meaningless. As a result, money that could have been used to fund programs like neonatal nutrition or uh, breast cancer screening, this money gets diverted to the immediate challenge of treating uh, patients with gunshot wounds or worse. And so the big learning for me in all this was that far too often, like so many places around the globe, it is the women and children who end up suffering. Women and children are the victims of the ongoing blockade of Gaza and what has been called the de-development of Gaza. And that's to say absolutely nothing about this horrendous threat of COVID-19. Sadly, the women and the children are far too often the ones who go without necessary treatment. Well, the promising news, uh, as I heard it, was that there is a lot of care and compassion that is being offered and shown in this hospital in Gaza City. Uh, the programs that are being offered have a profound positive effect on the lives of women and children. And at the same time, these program, programs remain very fragile and very vulnerable. And so they depend so much on our ongoing support and on, on our ongoing advocacy. Thanks so much. Thank you, Andreas. And uh, I know that for those of us, uh, myself included, who were able to visit Gaza, it was a, a poignant uh, and challenging experience. Uh, but the moment that was most difficult for me was that moment of leaving when we were leaving and folks we knew were staying and were so restricted in their mobility and options, including for things like vital health care. Um, so thank you for focusing on that. Um, I will turn now to uh, the Reverend Helen Smith, who represented the Presbyterian Church in Canada on, on the delegation, and ask uh, Helen to speak to us now. Uh, Reverend Helen. Thanks, Jennifer. During our time in Palestine, we had the privilege to meet several women's groups, groups facilitated by Lucy Talji. These groups have learned about their rights learned uh, about the UN Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, or the Security Council's Resolution on Women, Peace and Security, for example. They've not only learned, but they've put what they've learned into action in community building, in building peace, in mutual support. So in one community, we learned how they canvassed for improvements to the garbage disposal. And now they were working on getting a nurse into the school because the clinic is too far away. We learned about their social enterprises, embroidery, baskets, beekeeping, and we had a wonderful dinner in Jericho at a restaurant that these women had started up and were running. But in their own words, they are choking under occupation. Their movement is severely limited by checkpoints. There are settlements all around, and many have no choice but to work there, part of an illegal economy. Their children or their partners are in military detention without charges. We've already mentioned about the problems with water, limited access to water. Many children have emigrated looking for a better life than that under occupation. So we say no to annexation, but even more, we must say, end the occupation. We can support these groups of resilient women and they can support us. They are certainly an inspiration. In my denomination and probably in yours, the women's groups are the groups that move forward matters of social justice. During this time of COVID-19, we have discovered new ways of linking up. This webinar is an example of that. We talked the other day about connecting Canadian groups with Palestinian groups for mutual support, for exchanging our ideas, for learning from each other, how we can all advance equality. 
equality between Israeli and Palestinian, between settlers and indigenous peoples, between black, white, and people of color. The one quote that we all picked up on from Yosef Daher of the Jerusalem Interchurch Council of the World Council of Churches sticks with us all. Equality is the precondition for justice and peace will be the fruit. Equality is the precondition for justice and peace will be the fruit. Thank you. Over back to you, Jennifer. Thank you so Thank much, you. Helen. And uh, I, I particularly appreciate we, we know um, and we can tell the story of, of victimization of women and children in this broader context of occupation, but the it's also very important to focus on the role women uh, bring as uh, contributors, as survivors, as human rights defenders, as leaders in their communities uh, of the change from the grassroots up, uh, women peace builders as contributors to the broader sustainable peace. So thank you for helping us uh, focus on that at this time. I'm going to turn to our, our last uh, intervention from a delegate and welcome Paul Hansen, a uh, Roman Catholic priest from a, the Redemptorist congregation. Uh, Paul was on the delegation representing religious communities of uh, men and women, and I'll invite uh, Paul to speak with us now. Okay, thank you very much, Jennifer, and I appreciate the fact that Kairos initiated, supported, and developed this delegation to Palestine. As you suggested, I represented the religious congregations, Catholic orders of Canada, but Palestine was not new to me. I studied scripture in Palestine and I accompanied pilgrimages to the Holy Land over the years. And I'm also very much in touch with the Palestinian community here in Toronto, because when I'm in my office every morning, I have coffee with Palestinians. So as a result of that, I'm aware of the issues confronting Palestine because the people with whom I have con uh, coffee, they're in touch via Skype normally with their family members actually living in Palestine, Bethlehem, and in Jordan and Lebanon. And uh, so I'm aware therefore of the issues that we've spoken about, the occupation, the settlements, the torture, the jailings, and the annexations. And of course, while we lived in Palestine, uh, we found ourselves in a walled ghetto called Bethlehem. After a couple of days of our visit, I found myself in a very interesting place. I found myself sliding into a bit of a spiritual retreat for the time that I was in Palestine this time. I was incredibly interested in the folks that I met, the folks who traveled with us around and who associated with us in the varied communities that we met. I was interested in them and how they were personally living this human tragedy. The bigger political and demographic issues slid a bit to the back. And so I began to call what I was personally experiencing and that which I wanted to bring back to Canada. I was calling it a terrible beauty. Why did this retreat interest come upon me. A few years ago, when I returned from a similar exposure visit to Brazil, a friend of mine commented, Paul, why is it when you return from the global South, Africa, Latin America, Middle East, you're always excited, full of hope, you're very positive, and yet when you leave our middle-class Canadian conversations, you're kind of flat. I thought about his comment for weeks. And then I came to realize, and man, did it ever hit me in Palestine, that the folks in the global South and the Middle East seem to me to be living out of their essence, while most of us in the North of the Americas were living out of our extra. And of course, there's never enough extra when you live there. 
So for most of us, our experience in Palestine, I listened, observed deeply, and went out of my way to seek personal, intimate conversations with folks that we encountered. For example, I spent a bit of an afternoon with a medical doctor from Biet Saur, the manager of the hotel where we stayed, a couple of hours of conversation with him the employees of that hotel where we stayed, people I met when the mayor of Bethlehem gave us a, a, a supper and there were varied folks from varied religious commitments there. And then of course, when I was with Kairos, Palestine, I met with the patriarch. A few years ago on a similar visit to Latin America, a young person said to me, who was following me around for three days, Paul, having seen what you've seen and experienced what you have experienced, when you go back home to Toronto and do nothing, you're not only not a Christian, you're not even a human being. That comment haunted me the time I was in Palestine with the delegation. And that was the reflection I took away as I journeyed in flight back to Toronto. So for me personally, because I've seen so many similar kinds of delegations going to very places throughout our world, and it's nice to talk about it. It's very beautiful to say, hey, we're in the conversation, but it has to happen back here. And so for me, the question is, I'm a Canadian. What am I doing? if I say I am truly committed to the struggles in Palestine. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you very much, Paul, and for focusing us on what is our next task, I think, which is to shift to, to advocacy. Um, the delegation, uh, we, we had incredible hosts in WIAM. Um, who opened doors for us, who stretched themselves to engage the breadth in, our, in the perspectives we were offered, who found us shelter multiple times, who were um, our, our family while we were there. Uh, but we also benefited from resource people. Uh, the delegates uh, were very honored to have with us resource people who helped us uh, to wrestle, to reflect, um, and animated our delegation. And one of those was uh, Rachel Warden, who is the Kairos Partnership Manager, and she's kind of behind the scenes. You'll see her later. Uh, but another was the wise and committed uh, Wendy Gishuru, who is uh, staff of the United Church of Canada. And I'm going to invite Wendy, who was such a, a very important resource uh, and to us, uh, both before, during, and after the delegation to speak to us now about current advocacy priorities and opportunities for action. Thank you, Wendy. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I, I know that many of the people on this webinar um, are already very active and engaged in justice seeking, not just in Palestine and Israel, but uh, many of the issues confronting um, creation, so I will not um, presume to, to uh, um, be as, as comprehensive as I think we need to be, or as I should be, but I will just basically speak to some of the priorities that this delegation has raised in its report that we heard about from partners. Um, we all know that Palestinian and Israeli partners of the churches of Kairos Canada have been very clear about what is needed for realizing a just and lasting peace. And we am on this call has been very clear that an end to the occupation and the injustices that accompanied are key. This must happen. And that the missing piece in the quest for the peace that we so desperately hope for and work for and yearn for is justice. As, as uh, uh, Roz mentioned, as uh, we am uh, colleagues on this call have mentioned, a justice that upholds respect for human rights, the dignity and equality of all is essential. We have heard from partners in Palestine who are, are fellow Christians uh, that they have called on the churches around the world to engage in solidarity. 
and that they need us to take urgent, principled, and prophetic action in support of a just peace. They said this many times over the decades. More recently, they've said this very clearly in December 2009, when they issued the Kairos Palestine Moment of Truth. They said it again in June 2017 in the open letter from the National Coalition of Christian Organizations in Palestine. And they have just recently articulated a cry for hope again in July 2020. We struggle as churches in Canada about how to do this work of justice seeking for peace in Palestine and Israel because we are complicit in the injustice. As Canadians, we are complicit in the injustice. Our role in part is to amplify the call and the voices of partners, but our role is also to do our part to respond to what they have clearly stated is needed. And so there is work for us to do here in Canada. Some of the ways that we have tried to respond faithfully, this delegation visited Canadian representatives in Ramallah and in Tel Aviv. They had meetings in Ottawa in March of this year with MPs, with members of the government, with um, global affairs, and reiterated the calls that were made in the report. Most recently, Canadian churches have written to the Canadian government calling for the government to use all measures at its disposal to oppose annexation and the ongoing occupation. We have called for an end to the blockade on Gaza. Kairos Canada continues to amplify the voices of the women of courage that were highlighted in this webinar throughout its programs and in meetings in Ottawa, accompanied by partners from WIAM like Lucy and Tarek. Part of decolonizing our solidarity with our partners is for us as people of faith to ask ourselves, to ask our churches and our government some tough questions. Why does the occupation continue? What are the structures and policies and practices that maintain and sustain injustice, whether it is in Palestine and Israel or here at home in Canada, on Turtle Island? What is our role in sustaining injustice? And therefore, what must we do to dismantle that injustice and the systems that perpetuate it? We have heard today some of the ways that we can do that and some of the ways in which we are striving to learn what are the ways that we can engage. And these are some of the questions that church leaders on this delegation wrestled with in their visits with partners and since their return. In Canada, the Canadian political context and Canadian policy um, have been challenged by how Canada has engaged justice seeking in Palestine and Israel. Canadian policy is very clear that the occupation is illegal and annexation is illegal. The settlements are illegal. Canada can be more outspoken and explicit in implementing its own policy, as I've articulated, to support self-determination and international law and human rights. Whether at the UN or not, Canada can be a force for justice and for upholding international law. One way is that the, at the UN, Canada can be consistent with its own policy and with longstanding international law by voting for UN resolutions that call for an end to the occupation. We are concerned as Canadians about Canada's voting record at the UN. We were encouraged by its recent vote in December 2019 for self-determination or recognizing and affirming the self-determination of Palestinian people. But those votes need to be consistent. Those votes in favor of international law, in support of international law, need to be consistent. They cannot be piecemeal and they cannot be one-off. Our leaders, political and faith leaders, have often failed to do everything possible to work towards uh, a just peace in Palestine and Israel. Canada has an obligation to comply with international law. Churches have an obligation to speak truth to power and to call for justice. The church leaders who participated in this delegation have been doing this, as you heard on the call today, not only with the government, 
but within their denominations and ecumenically. One hoped for essential outcome of this webinar in hearing from we am partners and the church leaders on this delegation is that we renew our commitment in our denominations and across Canada to work for a just peace. All of us gathered today can take action and do everything we can to contribute to ending the occupation. Thank you for the action you take today, for the actions you have taken, and for your continued commitment to work for justice. You will see on your screen a particular ask. The focus right now has been on the um, looming annexation, whether it is by a formal announcement or the creeping annexation, which has continued to take over much of the land and displace uh, people from their homes, their farms, and their communities. If there's one action you take today at the end of this webinar, please write to your MP, write to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and call on Canada to take action to oppose annexation and to end the occupation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wendy, uh, for laying out some of the recent advocacy context and for being so clear in asking us to take action as a result of this conversation. Um, I think that for those who've already had that conversation with their MP, there really there is another piece there, and that is to have conversations with our colleagues, with our family, our friends in churches, in, in community groups, uh, and to ask them to um, to also take that kind of step uh, and that that's a critical piece to do as well uh, as taking it on your own. Um, we do have some uh, time for some questions and I, as I said I, I was going to focus the questions um, to our um, colleagues, uh, particularly uh, the, the partners. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm going, to, I have a question for Lucy, uh, uh, one for Tarek. Um, I uh, also will uh, probably turn to uh, Zugbi for the, for the last word or the wrap up. Um, but I also wanted, there is a question I think that's more about the delegation. And I wondered if as a, the co-chair, uh, whether Roz uh, would be able to respond to that, that question. So I'll start with, uh, I'm going to start with Lucy. Uh, Lucy, the, the, uh, there's a question that is really about uh, the particular uh, experience of women uh, hearing, hearing clearly about the multiple oppressions. How, uh, what is it that WEAM does? How does WEAM work? to help women to stand up uh, against those oppressions, recognizing that even to do so, to take steps to do so, can create uh, a greater risk for, uh, for women uh, as they take those steps, right, as they speak out. Uh, so how, what, is your, what are your strategies? How do you help women to speak out, uh, knowing that, in fact, even doing so might create risk for them? So I'll turn that over to you, Lucy. Um, the role of the women as a community leader, peace builder and activist can no more longer be denied in Palestine. We am recognized the urgent need to engage the women in the community on the social, political, uh, culture and economic uh, level. What our strategy to work on the three P's, protection, prevention and participation. And one of the most important things that uh, which uh, make uh, we am unique in that role, we are trying uh, to establish men alliance from our uh, colleagues and staff. We started to work on what we call it he for she uh, alliance in order to change the patriarchal mentality, which is the really most important that has a huge impact on the role of the women in their participation on social political level. This is one of the things that we are doing. The second uh, thing is strengthening the capacity of the women on different level on the, uh, economically because we found out that we or we believe that when the women they are totally economically independent, their situation would be totally different. So we are trying to uh, equip 
those women in skills and build on the skills that they have it in order they have their own small project in order that they increase their income, which is help them to be totally economically independent and that would help them to be a uh, voice. They, uh, uh, they can speak up for their rights, for the simple rights that they have. And also, uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, we are, uh, to the voice, uh, we as a center, our aim to carry the voice of the voiceless. So through the programs that we are working, we are trying to raise the voice of those women that uh, from the domestic violence, also uh, through the political participation, engaging women in political uh, participation when it comes to legislative council or municipal uh, council, uh, that another part. Also with the project that we are working with, Kairos Canada, that it's uh, really an honor to be partnered with Kairos Canada, which is on women, peace and security. And that's what we are working to create uh, a space for those women to have their and secure their uh, life, dignity, and income. Uh, actually, we have lots of programs. One of the programs that we've been working, we call it from zero to hero, and that's uh, one of the projects that helped women to to from like the women they were not uh, we ha they don't have any voice and they reach political uh, decision to be one of the decision making in in uh, local let's say in local councils and uh, another one we call it from baking to decision making so people think that the women that they the right uh, the right spot for them to be in the kitchen so we are trying to show the society it's really important to work on gender equity from young, with the young generation, and that's what we are trying to, to work with schools on gender, to understand the different role between men and women. And actually, this is a glimpse of the project that we are doing as a center, and maybe uh, my colleagues would like to add on what I mentioned. Thanks, uh, Lucy. I uh, and I'll t I'll turn to Tarek next, and he could add uh, as well as the question I'm going to throw to him. But um, yeah, I, I want to say how how important you are to the women's groups and how much uh, to help them with the capacity building and to come alongside them. Uh, we we saw that one of the ways that there was this uh, some sense of protection even while that capacity building was happening was the collective and their connection to you and to WEM as, as a place of support and that economic empowerment which gives them a sense of independence which also can help with their protection in the time and the critical role of working with uh, men and boys I think very important. Thank you, Lucy, for that work and for Thank your leadership. You. Um, Tarek, I'm going to give you uh, the challenging question, which comes up in a number of the, the, the things, the questions that have been raised. I'll group them together. And it is kind of the question was phrased in one context, wither Palestine. But it is the question of the concept of Palestine, where Palestine is a state. Uh, what, what say we about the two-state solution in this particular context, or is it uh, not more realistic to think about some kind of federation um, uh, and uh, some kind of uh, equality of rights within uh, one state? This is the question I would pose to you uh, to respond to. Um, it's kind of a question of both conceptual and what's realistic uh, and what are you looking at at this time? Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll start by commenting on Palestine, Palestinian territories, West Bank, Judea, Samaria, maybe what to call this, and because this is the foundation or root of the answer um, that I will provide. In a recent post of one of my friends with talks of annexation and this sentiment that is being shared now by many Palestinians, um, basically what was written is it called palestine is it called judea and samaria is it called israel is it called occupied palestine is it called the palestinian territories and then they end it by saying what's important is that we are able to continue to call it our home and so that's the essence 
of this. So in terms of the one state or two state solution, I think I saw in the questions as well, specifically about whether annexation being practiced or continued to being practiced kills the one two state solution. Um, and the answer is yes. It's very difficult for us to imagine the creation of a viable state or country when there is such a strong geographic discontinuity. And when the country doesn't have any borders of its own to control, and if the annexation continues, the creation of a Palestinian state would quote unquote be within the larger state of Israel, which means Israel would remain in control of the borders and would remain the middleman between Palestine and the international community. And that isn't sustainable or viable. In regards to the one state solution, it is very possible the two-state solution in the current context, although very difficult, is still possible. But it's not important whether it's a one-state or a two-state or a confederacy. What's important is what goes into any one of those systems. And so within this, what the Palestinians and I think the Israelis need is one, we need recognition of the past. For Palestinians, that means recognizing the very long history of suffering, of occupation, of marginalization, beginning from 1948, even under the British, under the Ottomans, till today. And within this, having recognition of many of the terrible events that we continue to live and experience, and that continue to live in our narrative, that continue to live in our oral tradition, we need to reconcile the pain that comes out of these stories. Um, the other thing that we need is equal rights for all, regardless of nationality or regardless of race, regardless of religion, regardless of socioeconomic political background. And that is for me as a Palestinian living in the state of Palestine or under Israel, or as an Israeli living in Israel under the state of Palestine or under a new formation of both of these people, groups, and countries. And the last thing we need is the right of movement, the right to enjoy the whole of the land. And this, as a Palestinian Christian, I cannot imagine any sustainable, long-lasting future of peace that's based in justice in which Jerusalem is removed, in which Jerusalem is restricted from my access, or in which I cannot go and enjoy the beautiful Lake of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee, whichever name we'd like to call it, or even to go and enjoy the desert in the south. And I would also like to believe that my Jewish brothers and sisters, same as my Muslim brothers and sisters, would also like to come and enjoy Bethlehem to go and see Jerusalem. We should all have equal right to enjoy the entirety of the land and have our rights afforded, respected, and given to us regardless of what nation or what system of rule is actually on the land. Um, and maybe for the last question, is it possible? The wonderful answer is yes. You can't negotiate with an earthquake, with a hurricane, or with a drought, but you can negotiate with people. And this injustice has people behind it, and we can negotiate with these people and we can work with each other toward justice. But to be able to reconcile our past and to move forward, as was said time and time again in this webinar, and as is part of the advocacy, we need your help, your support, and we need the international community's help and support to pressure Israel not to its knees, but instead to its senses and to help empower and bring the Palestinian voice to the fore so that it is heard. And that's my answer. <laughs> Thank, thank you so much, Tarek, uh, so much uh, for helping give the clarity of the conditions that are, that are really of the essence of the solution. Uh, so uh, there was um, something very important about the delegation, um, important for me and in my experience, I think for all of us uh, who were part of it, and that was that we were a diverse delegation, indigenous uh, settler newcomer together. Um, and that brought a particular kind of clarity uh, to this, uh, this particular visit, um, uh, maybe different than some of us had experienced before. And so there was a question, and I'll pose it 
to Roz for you to, as one of the co-chairs of the delegation, to share a little bit about how did we make the connections? Did we make the connections? How did we do that uh, in our experience uh, between uh, the situation of Indigenous peoples in Canada and the broader the Americas and the situation in Palestine, Israel? So I will uh, give you that question to respond to on, on all of our behalf. <laughs> Oh, well, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to truth tell. I'll tell you what. Um, I think that it was, I think it was difficult for everyone to come back to their, like I said, their Western context, uh, to come back to Canada, um, to, you know, to, to enter in back into their lives after, after this, uh, this life changing experience. So, um, uh, I, I think, I think everybody on this delegation was struggling, uh, in their, in their own way of, of, their own um, position um, uh, in their communities, and of course, in in in, in their livelihoods. Um, I, I I won't I won't claim that that was only on on myself. Um, I think we started to really recognize um, the similarities and the differences on the struggle between uh, the Palestinians um, and the state of Israel. Uh, and uh, the indigenous people of Canada, and the the um, government of Canada, or the state of Canada. Um, I think that uh, there is there are uh, certain certain broad strokes that um, Canada is certainly um, coming to realize, and that uh, I think the the people of of Israel um, are starting to realize, and that is. And that is the incremental uh, genocide of our people here in Canada, our indigenous people here in Canada, and the Palestinian people um, there in, in West Asia. I think that um, um, politically uh, our, our contexts are different. Um, Tarek spoke of the one state, two state, or, or confederacy uh, question. Um, those are, are broad political questions um, that have that have very that are variegated answers. Um, we uh, consider ourselves Canada's original people, and that of course brings up a whole bunch of differences between our situations. Um, but I think that we have to really concentrate on the fact that. Um, what is really at stake here, again, as I said, is personhood, uh, the ability to participate in democracy, the ability to have a voice um, is, 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 is critical to us, the, the ability to uh, establish our, our sovereignty within our own, within our, ourselves, within our communities, um, can happen without these basic human dignities of clean water these basic human dignities of being able to go with your child as a young father to go with your child to the hospital. Um, that, is, that, is, that is critically important to uh, the Palestinian communities and the, the Palestinian people. Um, same critical to, to us as well. So we really struggle uh, with that uh, together. And that is a question to um, uh, non-Indigenous Canada and to settler communities in Israel is you have a place of privilege in which the government protects you. And we fight that daily. And so, and I say we, I say, I say that in, in, in uh, unity with my Palestinian brothers and sisters, um, that um, those are, those are some, those are some, some striking Simulate, sim, uh, similarities um, uh, that we that we share. Um, <clears throat> I think also when I think of like, for instance, um, Lucy's uh, very um, uh, groundbreaking work in Palestine. I mean, she has she has the heart of of a native woman, and there are women uh, in Canada like her who who work to. Um, create spaces for these voices to come through. I mean, as we believe that women are the, the life givers of a nation. And so it's really important that we support initiatives that, that uh, 
uh, Lucy is, is so passionate about because again, she's not only um, giving that space, but these women are are learning again some of the some of their their ancient arts that they have lost. Um, and they are becoming stronger women, stronger mothers, stronger sisters, and stronger wives. Um, and that really, really builds, really builds uh, a nation. So I think, you know, this is, this is so important, um, both in Canada and in Palestine. Um, the work that Riam does with Tarek and, and uh, Mr. Zugby, they're so, um, uh, so important to the wider cultures and, and certainly bringing dialogue um, to, uh, to the to various communities, both uh, Palestinian communities and in um, Israeli communities who are working together to, to create a just and, and, and peace um, place there in uh, the ancient in the ancient lands. So I think that um, our struggle our struggles are are similar. Uh, it is it is important that privileged Canada uh, support uh, these initiatives, both in in Canada and in Palestine and in, in, in the world. Um, it takes all people to build peace. And it takes all of us to come together uh, with our with our many backgrounds uh, to create <clears throat> uh, equal rights and dignities for for ourselves for each other. Uh, that recognition of personhood, I think, is is crucial and is critical uh, both in Canada and Palestine. Um, one of the things that that uh, before I before I give before I I, I end one of the things that um, Tarek had mentioned was the recognition of the past. Um, and that too is, is critical to uh, Canada's understanding of their privilege. Uh, it is critical to um, the state of Israel's understanding of the incremental um, genocide of, of, of the Palestinian people. Um, it's also important for us as indigenous people and as as my brothers and sisters in Palestine, is to recognize how that has affected us. Um, I, I remarked several times during the delegation that we have normalized in Canada the reserve structure. This is not normal to live in a block of land that is governed uh, by the federal government is not normal. To struggle with clean water when just uh, when just 25 miles away there is a, wa a water that is that is that flows flows freely is not normal. It's not normal, and the Palestinian people they struggle against against um, normalizing that way of life, but they wake up to it every day just as we do, um, and I think it's important as 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 we go forward is to recognize those, those little events. Um, again, that's going, going back to recognizing how this, this uh, colonizing, colonization has affected us, has affected uh, our social fat, has affected our, our bodies. Um, so um, I, I, I stand in solidarity with uh, my Palestinian brothers and sisters. And I hope that my Indigenous brothers and sisters uh, do the same as uh, I speak to councils and so on um, here in Canada. Thank you for the question, Jennifer. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Roz, and for your leadership uh, in this process um, and reminding us of this centrality of Indigenous leadership and Palestinian leadership in this struggle and the responsibility and accountability of white settlers uh, to uh, to take our proper place uh, uh, as allies and coming alongside, um, but to do so accountable for our privilege and uh, rec and in recognition of the colonization that that is continuing and it needs to end uh, in both contexts. Um, so I, I will uh, give the last word today to our friend. Um, and colleague uh, Zubi Zubi, and um, you you see the questions, but uh, I will maybe ask you about uh, 
about vision and about hope and about what if there's something you want us to do next what is that and I will uh, leave that last word with you so be as we and then we will have some thank yous and wrap up for this morning well I am shivering with hope and I'm lifted to hear such deep voices for justice and peace and reconciliation. You know, this kind of spirituality is needed nowadays that transcends denominations. And when I hear you, I feel this kind of spirituality of resistance that is needed nowadays here. Spirituality of resistance and creativity. And since we talk about hope, I like the verses of the second Corinthians chapter four, verses eight to nine, which says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. This kind of thing helps me to keep hope. This verse, this, this paragraph sustains my hope. And also my hope coming from the fact that we belong to the land, all of us. And as one of the leaders of the First Nation people, Sitting Bull says, man belongs to the earth earth does not belong to man. So all of us, regardless of our faith, regardless of our nations, color, gender, belong to the earth. The earth does not belong to us. It is a call of inclusivity. It is a call for respecting each other and also diversity in unity. I believe the voice I heard from you is a prophetic voice. And the work you do is a prophetic action that all of us say occupation is evil and we need to end it and to let people coexist with mutual respect, with inclusive call for justice. As you know, our kids, our youth suffered a lot. One third of the male population in Palestine have been in prison. One third has suffered from the prison. More than 20,000 women have been in prison since 1967. So a call to free us all, let my people free. And this is very important message to see our cause internationalized because at this moment, it is very difficult to solve this kind of conflict to end the occupation by only dialogue or negotiation between Israel and Palestine. We need the international community to bear its responsibility to help end the occupation. When I see 52 members of the parliament in Canada sign a memorandum to end the annexation, to stop the annexation, to end the occupation, it is hope. It is really a call for hope. And as Palestinians, we always look to convert, to transform crises to opportunities. As a result of the threat of annexation, Palestinians more are more united. We work for diversity and unity. And we are making connections. And there are hope in reading the history. You know, we talk about the wall in Berlin. After 28 years, the wall is no longer there. We talk about the apartheid system in South Africa. After 42 years of systematic apartheid is no longer there. We talk about civil rights movement, despite there's some pockets of racism in the States, but Martin Luther King was able to transcend, to move, to transform. And in the Balkans, the conflict stopped. So this kind of hope, you know, we need it more and more to see end the occupation. And nowadays, if we make some mathematics, 
that Israel is talking about annexing almost Area C, or it could be 60%. We don't want to lose our cause in percentage-wise, 10%, 60%, 1%. But if we talk about Area C, 60%, and if we make such equation, the West Bank is 22% of the historic land. Cross 60%, almost equal 13%. This is where the black Africans in South Africa used to own before they changed from apartheid to better situation. I think hope for us is a form of faith, a form of nonviolent struggle. With you, we are all able to move forward. And especially when we talk about women, you know, since the start of We Am in 1994, we impart on empowering women. And we created a lot of coalitions between men and women. And I think there will be no freedom if the women are not free. Especially our women does not compose only 50% of the population, but they raise the other 50. And with your voices, with your support, you are you know, helping us more. You are empowering us to walk in this less traveled road, despite of Gavite, despite of the occupation, and despite on the personal issue, the separation between my wife and children in the States and in Bethlehem. This kind of uh, unholy trinity, if you'd like, on the personal level, we are able to overcome it. On the uh, national level, we are able to conquer it. And on the international level, justice will be the call and will be the march and will be the drums to uh, beat in order to free all the nations. And as the South African leader, Bishop Tutu says, and Mandela, of course, the uh, South Africa will not f be free until Palestine is free. Mm -hmm. And we need the freedom for Jews, Muslims, and Christians to live together in two-state solution or one state to guarantee that equality and inclusivity and reciprocity as the umbrella for any solution. Mm -hmm. We'd like to thank you all for your support, for your empowerment. And I tell you frankly, also, we shouldn't uh, not think of the peace camp in Israel, the Jewish peace of voice in the world. Despite they are getting smaller, but they are a voice and they are a ray of hope. It is also a part of renewable hope for us. Thank you all. And we would like to invite you again by saying there is more room in the end now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Zugbi. Persistence is required. Our persistence, our action to bring forth a transformation and that, that justice uh, for all. Um, I, my last words are of gratitude um, to all of you who have been present and listening and uh, reflecting. Uh, for the gift of your attention and your solidarity in action. I want to thank our partners. <laughs> Zugbi and Tarek and Lucy very much for your clarity and for your generosity and for your hope. Uh, we want to strive to live up to the call that you are issuing to us in this context. I want to thank our delegates for their words and for their uh, speaking from their hearts of their own experience. Uh, they were church leaders, but ordinary people uh, who went and experienced and uh, we, we are committed to persisting in our advocacy. I want to thank our trusted advisor, uh, Wendy, and uh, Rachel also, who you now can see on the screen, who were resource people to our delegation, uh, that was so helpful to us. I want to thank uh, Kirsten, who has been working uh, to support this webinar and the work around uh, Palestinian advocacy, advocacy for just peace, uh, who you can see, Kirsten Van Houten, um, and helped us with the presentation today. And uh, we couldn't have done this without uh, the technical assistance of Gabriela Jimenez and Giselle Del Rosario, who um, helped to uplift us and facilitate us and make this all uh, possible. So I hope you can see their faces on the screen too, to bring them from uh, behind the scenes to in front of 
the scenes as a critical part of this uh, this process that we were in this morning. And uh, I just uh, close really with my uh, deepest hope for our collective action uh, as hope made real in this world. And thank you to all of you uh, for being present with us in this time. Thank yous are technically done, but also thank you to you <laughs> for, and to Tyrus and for all the work you do. But.